before I talk about a few things about why code. What, what are you trying to do by coding? Well, obviously you're going through the text and trying to find what's there by identifying things. That, that's the first thing. And if that's all you did, that itself would be useful. But actually coding was invented, it was developed by Becker and then Pleasure and Strauss for the first purpose, the retrieval. The idea was that having coded the text, particularly fed in long passages, you could then retrieve the text. And that means bringing together all the text that is coded in the same way. And then look at it and start to make comparisons about it. And of course, how you do that is, 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 a, is a, an, an interesting point. I'll, I'll mention that in a moment. The second thing that coding does for you is it begins to enable you to think about the codes themselves. I call it the coding frame here, sometimes called the coding list. So looking at the codes you've got and reorganising them, rethinking about them, and even at that stage beginning to identify what might be major themes, major codes, that might constitute the beginnings of your write-up, your analysis and so on. So you can begin to think about it at the coding level, almost taking the codes away from the transcripts and just simply looking at the list of codes and thinking about them. And certainly it's quite a lot to be got from doing this now. By the way, why do we retrieve? Well, we retrieve because we want to get the evidence. Um, let me say something about retrieval. Retrieving means getting all the text coded with the same label, all the passages about the same phenomenon, idea, explanatory activity. And literally, it's cut and paste. Um, I mean, traditionally, it was done using envelopes and files and so on. So people would actually get their interviews, they would code them up, they would then photocopy the coded versions, um, many, many copies of them, and then they get the scissors out and begin to cut them up. And they cut out the text that's coded this way, they put it into an envelope with that label on it, and any time they found another passage coded the same way, they cut it out with an envelope. And in the end, the envelope or the file contains all the passages that had that coded name. And they could then lay them out the table and see what do people say about these things? What do people say about this particular phenomenon that I've coded here? What's going on? Now, if you're very clever as you do that, you actually label the bits of paper as you put them in the envelopes so you know which interview they came from. It helps have a little code written on them so you can tell who it was, either the number of the interviewee or perhaps a code that identifies perhaps their gender, their age, and something else about them that identifies them. Um, and then you can, when you lay out the passages, you're looking at all the passages about so and so, you can see, ah, there's a pattern here. People who are you know, over a certain age tend to say this, and people who are younger than a certain age tend to say this. And there's a group in the middle of the sense saying anything that's different. So you begin to get patterns as you retrieve the text. You begin to identify patterns in the, the code you've got. And that's a very traditional way of doing it. That, that how, that's, that's why I think the, the coding approach was first identified. Um, because it enables this kind of cross-case comparison on the same theme. You can lay out on the table, or on the desk, or on the floor perhaps, if you need a very big space. Or on the wall. Some people talk about putting things up on the wall. and, and you know, blue tacking everything to the wall to look at it. Perhaps it's slightly more comfortable up on the wall. You know, of course, walls could be a bit bigger than tables. Um, but you can see everything around and, and move things around and begin to kind of structure a pattern and, be, and begin to make these cross-case comparisons. So you can say things like, these cases tend to do this, these cases tend to do that, and these cases tend to do something else. So you've got a, a pattern within that code. And that's what retrieval's all about. On the other hand, as I said, you can use the coding frame, the, the list of codes, and start working with that. Well, several things to be pointed about this. Sorry, to be said about this. You can begin to use that to, to think up new analytic questions about the data, which you can't necessarily answer with the coding scheme itself. You must do more work with it. But you can start to look at relationship between the codes and the text they code. So you might say, ah, what's the relationship between this code and that code? Do people who tend to say that also do this? Now that's quite difficult to answer if you've done the previous thing, you put things in envelopes. Because what you've then got, you've got to say, okay, I've now coded everyone who said this, I've got all their codes together. But I've got in the other code here all the people who did this. People who said that, people who did this. There's a relationship between them. And it's, you can imagine you've got two tables now with all bits of paper laid out. You're going to try and find a relation between them. Is there kind of any similarity here? Um, and of course, 
ideally you've got certain cases that don't appear in either pile, so you've got to have those in mind as well. That's quite a hard activity, it requires lots of sorting out and comparing, oh, that's the same person as that, that's the same person as that, you know, even perhaps moving them together in some kind of fashion to reorganise them. And so that's one of the reasons of using software. Software makes that activity so much easier to do. You can start to do those things very, very quickly. All the reordering of bits of paper is done for you by the software. It'd be down. You can also get to group cases, and again, the coding frame can't do that, but it can suggest that there might be reasons for, for grouping cases. People who, who have had this kind of background might be doing these kind of things. Where does the coding frame come from? Um, well, is your approach deductive or inductive? I mentioned these terms a few weeks ago. Um, inductive meaning they are come, they come from the data potentially, and this is the, the approach that gravity theory promotes, whereby you strongly um, base your ideas of coding in the data you found. By contrast, the deductive approach says we start with some theory, we start with some ideas, and from those we produce our coding scheme. In fact, I think most qualitative analysts do both. Um, even if they're claiming to be grounded theorists, they often come with ideas that they then apply and construct their coding scheme from. So they start with some theoretical ideas. Where do those come from? Well, they come from reading literature, of course, from your own familiarity with things. You know, maybe you've been in this context before, uh, before you started doing research. You might have your own research questions that you started from. And of course, you'll have an interview schedule if you should, will raise issues that your respondents talked about. And those themselves are candidates for codes. So in fact, it's not quite as difficult as I said to begin with. You've already got here by looking at literature, by having your own questions, and by looking at the schedule you've constructed, you've now got some issues that you can start to code for, theoretically. So template analysis is both deductive and inductive. I think it is, yes. yes. Yes, that yeah. I mean, clearly, the, the point in tech analysis is that you would you, know, you use this kind of technique here to construct the coding scheme. Um, but at the same time, you also read the first case and use what's in front of you to construct themes as well. So it's a, it becomes like a, a coincident combination of both. You do both at once. Yeah. You don't have to construct a coding scheme entirely, but, you know, from the deductively from the trends on, but you do start with that in mind as you, as you, uh, as you start reading the first case. Yeah. But definitely it is inductive and deductive. And then of course, you, as you read the, the data, we hope it goes beyond what you started with. And like I said, template analysis starts doing this, discover new ideas, new theories, new explanations new phenomena in the data. So you've got a starting point, but you use some of the ideas I've gone over just now to create and think about new things that you, you haven't realised were there. Now, um, oh, sorry, it's just because it's now another way of, of getting at codes. I've already mentioned this at the end of Evo code idea that comes from Strauss. Okay, here's an example, another example of coding. Um, I want to use this I mean, now you've seen what coding looks like, uh, typically. I want to use this to get to another set of ideas about how you move from descriptive coding by reading the text into a much more analytical frame. Um, and I'm reading this text here, and if you've read my book, uh, yeah, I use it in the book, so it's, it's not a little bit of games in there. Um, here's a, a man, Barry, talking about living with his wife who has Alzheimer's disease. And he talks here about the things they did together and the things they can't do together. So he's talking about going dancing, uh, which he can't do now, has to go on his own. Um, and then he used to go into a bowling with her at sports center, but of course that's gone by the board now as well. Um, she can hardly walk, she's not, but she's very badly coordinated now, it's that, that bad. That you can't find. So I managed to get down to the works club, so she can walk around with help, and she just sits down um, and uh, and she takes over the dancing, but she doesn't dance, she actually just sits and listens. Uh, she stays for a couple of hours and then she doesn't laugh. As long as we gain, I take her out in the car, so once she gets from the car, I get her out of the car. So what's going on here? Well, I suggest there are certain descriptive things we can talk about. 
So here's some possible codes, dancing, indoor bowling, dance and work clubs, driving. These are activities, very simple activities um, that, that go on back into the, the, the Loughland um, um, terminology. They're very descriptive. They're there, they're in the text. That's exactly what Barry said. Barry used those terms. Descriptive codes. Then there are another way of looking at it is in terms of joint activities have ceased and joint activities are continuing. You can say there's a divide in this passage in between where he talks about the things he can't do anymore with his wife and the things he does do with his wife still. So they begin to get away from his terminology, although you could say he's dividing things that way, so it's not quite removed from him. We're beginning to move in that direction to so these more analytic ideas, categorizing the, the responses. And there's one or two other things you can talk about here. I, I, these are my suggestions now about things you might put in here. Um, loss of food coordination, that's something which his wife is experiencing. Togetherness, a, a concept about the way he's describing his relationship with his wife in some of his activities. Idea of doing for, he has to do things for her in some ways. Um, he talks about that elsewhere in the interview, actually. Maybe a sense of recognition. Um, that comes from this, and perhaps a core activity as well. It's again, I picked this out from this passage of dancing. We actually talked about dancing a lot. They did dancing a lot together when we were younger. Now, he doesn't mention those things. These are not categories. Well, he doesn't mention dancing, but um, you know, the idea of core activity. He doesn't say this is a core activity for me. This is a theoretical concept. This is me as researcher coming in and applying my ideas to it. So getting away from a descriptive set of terms into a more theoretical idea. And um, so we might call these analytic codes now. Now whether they're good ones or bad ones is another matter. I'm not making any great claim for being a great insight here into, into the theory, but, but nonetheless it's, it, I'm just trying to show you how you begin to move from a, theory, a sorry, descriptive approach to a more analytical approach of what's going on. So here's what it might look like when it's marked up. Um, and you've got the normal kind of bracketing here, indicating the descriptive um, things. Um, going on, notice how it's overlapping as well. And I've used these boxes here to indicate the joint activities ceased and the, the ones that continue. So this is what's going to tell around, actually. That's a mistake in the diagram. These are the ones that are now finished, and these are the ones that continue. And then the doing for is, is also represented by this thing here, where he's effectively talking about ways in which he does things for her rather than with his wife. And so there's a subtle change of approach there. And I've also circled some other terms here that, that might say a representative of resignation. You know, again, you perhaps got to listen to the original interview to, to hear this, but well, it was always a kind of sigh there, well, well, we used to, well, she can't, and the combination of well with the negative, and it gives a sense of, well, you know, well, it, it's, it used to be, but it isn't anymore, kind of resignation. So. Um, and of course, the term that's gone by the board now might be a kind of that might be the name of the code actually. You might say it's gone by the board. That's a, you know, that's a kind of a, an in vivo term to, to use. 